All right. So welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Vinnie Reggae, and I'm the dean of uh, New Bedford campus. And I also serve as uh, the dean of uh, business administration academic uh, area. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone to our beautiful campus uh, here in New Bedford, especially to all the students, faculty from Pakistan, uh, students and faculty from Bristol Community College, and uh, special kudos to Representative uh, uh, Cabral as well as uh, Janet from Mayor's office uh, who is here. So appreciate you being here. So since I'm the Dean of New Bedford Campus and you guys are here in New Bedford, uh, I actually get the chance to brag about New Bedford Campus, right? So uh, just a couple of things about uh, New Bedford Campus. It is the second largest campus uh, within Bristol Community College system. Okay, we have close to about 600 students uh, taking classes in over 27 certificate and degree programs uh, right in this building. It's sort of like as a one-stop shop uh, for all our students, and the reason I'm saying one-stop shop is because uh, 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 students get all the wraparound services uh, right here in, uh, on campus, right from admissions, enrollment, advising, uh, we have one of the best library. If you actually ever get a chance, go up on the fifth floor and just like peek outside the window, you get the most fabulous, fabulous view uh, of uh, uh, the city of New Bedford. Uh, we also have uh, tutoring services, uh, online uh, education assistance, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are deeply rooted in the community. We are the only uh, entity of higher education in the city of New Bedford uh, as we speak. Uh, we get great support from the community organizations as well as elected officials. Uh, so uh, very, very privileged to be in this, uh, in this uh, city. Uh, with that said, I know we have a very, very uh, limited time, so I'm going to hand it over to Farah Habib, and welcome everyone. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, Dr. Douglas, for your support of APEX and for being here today. And thank you, Andrew Fisher, for being here and the entire PLT. Uh, we appreciate your presence here. Um, I also want, uh, if you can please join me in welcoming our honored guests from Pakistan um, and New Bedford. But first, our honored guests from Pakistan are sitting here to my right. I have uh, uh, Professor Zubda Zia, who is a co-director of APEX. I have Zoya Shafe, who is a faculty member at Kinnaird. And we have uh, Numra Mahmood, who is another faculty member at Kinnaird. Um, I on to my left here, we have um, uh, Representative Tony Cabral from New Bedford. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your presence. Um, and also, I cannot forget that uh, the students from Kinnaird, we have you here. Uh, and you will be recognized in shortly. Um, uh, and I also want to recognize our own students from Bristol as well. Um, so just an overview of the last few days. Um, um, the Kinnaird College students and faculty arrived last Saturday, and it feels like all the days are melting together. Um, and we've been going since then. Um, it's been de a delight to see the Pakistan students walking around campus, attending classes, sitting alongside our Bristol students in the library as they worked on their projects, which you'll get to hear about uh, shortly. And then on the bus and the, tra the train to New York City, having lunch conversations and just getting to know each other. It's been a great delight. Just it's made it all worth it. Um, we've accomplished a lot. Um, um, in the last five days. Uh, it's been busy, but most fun and rewarding to see all of us come together in this way. And so to the students, thank you for bringing your all to this. Um, and also, I cannot um, move forward without a special thank you to the planning committee, uh, Professor Shelley Murphy and Professor uh, Stacy Hess. I cannot list here all the ways in which you guys have made this possible from everything from like running to get apps for the social event to arranging for the guests to stay in a nice Airbnb. Um, I, it, the, the list is long and it would not have been possible without the two of you. Can I just have a hand, show of hand, applause for the two of you, thank you. Um, 
I also want to take a few minutes to thank the different areas of the college that have come together, catering services, marketing and communications, the librarians, Emily and Laura Hogan, uh, administrative staff, Lisa Noel, Liz Perez, Lisa Parsons, Tina Marie, and Laura P P Pironi. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot more, so please forgive me. Uh, I just want to quickly talk a little bit about Apex. So when I took a sabbatical in 2021, all I was looking to do was write about my family and about the experiences of living between two worlds, as a Pakistani, as an American. I was trying to explore the many facets of my identity. I was born in Pakistan, but I grew up in the West with the US being the place where I came of age, attended college, launched my career, and raised a family. So when the opportunity came for me to travel back to Pakistan in 2021, I must admit I was scared, but I took the risk and I traveled along, um, alone actually, back to the country of my birth. I carried with me uh, many images fed to me by sound bites and media headlines, and I had no idea what awaited me when I arrived. I had no idea that I would meet um, amazing colleagues like Zubda and Professor Paul Edelman, who couldn't be here of Sauk Valley and that we would work together to create this reciprocal cultural exchange between our three colleges. We are in our second year of the exchange where Kinnaird visits us in the fall and we visit Kinnaird in the spring. This coming spring, if we get our grants, we will travel with faculty and some students to Lahore in February, inshallah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Lahore is a breathtaking city, only 20 miles from the border of India, and I know Vinny's here, so I wanted to mention India. Um, author Bobsi Sidwa says about Lahore that it is sheer architectural poetry, and to belong to, this, to Lahore is to be steeped in romance, to inhale with each, with each breath an intensity of feeling that demands expression. So, end quotes. If the city of Mughals, it is the city of Mughals, artists, great food, academic institutions of international standards, and wonderful people like our guests here today. So before I request President Douglas to say a few words, I wanna end by saying to our Pakistan students, thank you for taking the risks to come to a new country, to explore a new group of people, and to step outside your comfort zone. Um, and to our Bristol students, thank you for being curious about Apex, to take time away from the demands of your school and personal lives to meet people that I hope that you can now call your friends. Um, and I can't wait to see what your collaborations are going to lead to, and I'm really looking forward to your presentations in a bit. So thank you, and I now invite President Douglas. Thank you so much, Professor Habib. And it is my great honor to welcome our exchange students and faculty from uh, the American Pakistan Educational Exchange, that's APEX, Cultural Immersion Program. And I am immensely proud of the work you've accomplished together and the depth of your presentations. And we are so looking forward to hearing more about those. So though your time with us may be a little uh, more brief than we would like, I am confident that your experiences and the knowledge knowledge that you've gained through this experience will have a lasting and productive impact on your personal and academic journeys. So it has been a joy uh, to see you actively engaged on our campuses, attending events, lectures, and uh, the amazing Voices of the Land photo exhibit that I was able to um, be a part of yesterday. So thank you so very much. I also want to thank all of you who have been a part of welcoming our guests and uh, with such warmth and hospitality and the entire college community who came together to make this visit extra special. I especially want to thank Farah Habib, Stacy Charbonneau Hess, Stacy, I know you're here, there you are right there, Stacy, and Shelly Murphy uh, for your dedication to making our exchange program a success. And it was Stacy, Farah, and Shelly uh, who were able to visit uh, Lahore and Kennard uh, College last February. I also want to thank Dr. Uram Umjun 
principal of Kennard College for her commitment to continuing the APEX program. Dr. Unjum is new to her role and was not able to make it uh, this year, but hopefully we'll be able to welcome her in the future. I also want to thank our Kennard fa faculty members, Zubta Zia and Zoya Shafe and Namra Med Medmud. So thank you very much for uh, all that you've done for this program and also want to uh, thank, last but not least, our special guests who have joined us today, Representative Tony Cabral, who represents uh, the New Bedford area and has been a great supporter of Bristol Community College. Some of you may not know this, but uh, Representative Cabral is an alum of Bristol Community College, so uh, that's uh, he has a very special place in our hearts. Uh, also I also want to thank uh, 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 a representative from Mayor Mitchell's office. Unfortunately, Mayor Mitchell could not be with us to be with here to, with us today. But we have Janet Barbosa, who is here. Janet, thank you so much, and please uh, bring our respects back to Mayor John Mitchell. Uh, it is uplifting to see how our shared goals can bridge borders and transcend cultures. Uh, to our friends from Pakistan, thank you so much for becoming a part of our community, for sharing your experiences, and for enlightening us about your rich culture. We also deeply appreciate the warm welcome you extended to Bristol during, during our visit to your beautiful country this past February. It reminds us that our journey toward a better world is rooted in understanding and embracing one another. Your presence here serves as a powerful reminder of the common threads that unite us all as human beings. So I would now like to ask Azubda, uh, our professor of, assistant professor of economics uh, and head of the department, uh, to the podium. Dr. Laura Douglas, President, Bristol Community College, Representative Tony Cabral, esteemed faculty and students of Bristol Community College, and esteemed faculty, my colleagues and students from Kinnaird College, and esteemed guests, good morning and assalamu alaikum. On behalf of my colleagues, Professor Namra and Professor Zoya, and our students, Fatima, Minahil, Uniza, Hania, Samahir, and Shanze, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude for your hospitality and warmth. Ever since we arrived here, we felt at home. Last year, we brought our first cohort from Kinnaird College for Women, and you welcomed us with open hearts. Bristol faculty graciously allowed our students to attend their classes. You allowed them to ask questions and engage in discussions on sensitive and pertinent topics. We, re we returned home more informed, better educated, and happier because our interactions with the American people helped us know you better, which allowed us to respect you more and appreciate the diversity and inclusivity that we keep hearing about. This time, we are back with our second cohort, and we are touched to see that the warmth, hospitality, and generosity was a notch up. I'm so grateful to Professor Shelley, Professor Jackie, and Professor Rebecca for allowing our students to sit in their classes and engage with your brilliant students. Not only did you make them feel at home, rather, you helped them come out of their comfort zones and engage in discussions. I've had the privilege of being an exchange, um, on an exchange program funded by the US Department, and I know what an amazing experience it is to delve into a foreign culture, have candid discussions, laugh over jokes, and enjoy their cuisines. You all allowed our students to experience this magic, so thank you for the opportunity. I'm so proud of the Bristol students. Your level of dedication and commitment to the collaborative project was phenomenal. Zach, Edward, Alexandria, Peyton, Haley, Krishna, and AJ, thank you for being part of Apex. It was, it was amazing, heartwarming to see you guys get along so well with Kinect students. The day trip to New York and the movie night and one of the groups got lost, and how Zach was, you know, looking after them, looking for them. <laughs> you know, everything will be remembered. I hope the new friendships and bonds that you formed will grow only stronger, 
and someday you'd plan to visit Pakistan, please know that we at Kinnaird would love to host you. I'm grateful to Laura Hogan and uh, Janet Ray for helping us set up the exhibit at the library, and to each one of you who could take out time to come and see the exhibit. All those pictures that you saw were taken by the children of the villages, and all those were their original stories. It was heartwarming to see many of you touched by the experience. It proves that we all are more similar than we are different. We all appreciate kindness. We reciprocate love with warmth, share same emotions of empathy. I wish we could just do away with politicians, with my due apology to any policymakers here. I would just wish we could do away with politicians and governments and take charge. I bet this world would be a much better, safer, and a happier place only if the common people like us were to be at the helm of affairs taking important decisions. I want to thank Vinnie Reggie and the fact that you're Indian makes you all the more special, you're you know, next door neighbor, and I wish you could visit Pakistan someday, we'd love to host you. Kevin, um, Kevin, Steve Rice, Kendall, and Joyce for all your help. Dr. Douglas, Apex would not have been possible without your unflinching support. The fact that you yourself have been on multiple exchanges proves that you're cognizant of the significance of these people-to-people -people interaction. Thank you for having faith in Professor Farah's unlimited abilities and talents and extending all your support to her to carry out this amazing project. On behalf of Kinnaird College, I thank you for giving the Innovation of the Year Award to Professor Farah. Because there, I don't think there is, there is anyone more worthy of that. So thank you. I cannot leave without thanking Dr. Jennifer Puniello for all her support for Apex. I don't know if she's here. The workshops that she con uh, conducted at Kinnaird left an indelible mark. She was here with us um, at Kinnaird in February, and we cherish each moment that we spent with her. Professor Stacy, thank you for opening your heart and your home to us. Your generosity has been phenomenal. Our students and faculty still remember the brilliant workshops that you, connect, you know, conducted at Kinnaird, and that little episode where you know, we had to get that passport fixed, and the, you know, <laughs> you know, those moments, they're gonna be cherished forever. Thank you, Mark, for letting your beautiful wife be with us for a week, and I, I think we took good care of her. <laughs> Professor Shelley, thank you for being with us all along. We loved you accompanying us to New York. It was so much fun. Your keynote talk at Kinnaird impressed everyone. And we can't you know, wait to have you back again. Last but not the least, Professor Farah Habib, co-director of Apex, and now I can proudly say, and a good friend. Let me congratulate Bristol Community College for this powerhouse of a woman that you have. Not only, yes, and we can clap. Not only is she incredibly smart and articulate, she's really enterprising. Farah, you impressed Kinnaird with your heartwarming keynote talk, and now we can't wait to have you back again and speak at the most coveted literary festival in Lahore. I'm sure Vinnie would have heard of the Fairs Festival. Professor Farah will be speaking there. Apex could not have been possible without you, Farah. Thank you for everything. I hope you realize that Apex is affecting lives across continents. And you, my friend, have been instrumental in bridging the gaps between continents, and that's huge. On behalf of Dr. Paul Edelman, my friend and co-director of Apex, I thank you. And I want to tell you that we are proud of this dynamic trio of ours, and we're just getting started. I know for a fact that this is just the beginning, and Apex is going to do wonders, so gear up, everyone. And thank you for your time, and thank you for being here. <laughs> President Douglas and Professor Habib, can I please request you to join me in handing out the certificates? So now we'd like to uh, hand out uh, certificates to our students who participated in this uh, the last five days. So I would like to start by calling the students from Pakistan first. Um, so Samahir Ali.
Hania Adnan. Fatima Iqbal. Shanze Kashif. Minahil Javed. Uniza Mahboob Rana. Now for the Bristol students. I'd, I'd like to call up Alexandra Cousineau. <laughs> Krishna Morrow. Haley Ordinez. <laughs> Zachary Sarkarati. Last but not least, <laughs> oops, Edward Sullivan. So another round of applause for our students, please. And represent. If I could ask Representative Tony Cabral to please join us. Thank you. Well, this is a tough act to follow. <laughs> but let me begin by thanking Stacy for uh, inviting me through, uh, on behalf of the Bristol Community College, of course, uh, President Douglas and Dean Regay, right? I got that pronunciation correct, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, and welcome all of you, and obvi obviously this is a little farewell instead of a welcoming ceremony, right? Uh, I'm sure uh, the, the last few days that you have spent here, uh, in particular in New Bedford, right? I, mean, I understand you stayed in New Bedford, right? Uh, New Bedford is a very special place. Not, not only for those who live, like myself, in the city, but represent the city in the state legislature, uh, but to the state as well. As you might be aware, um, New Bedford is uh, the number one fishing community in the United States of America. Right? We have around 400 uh, boats that uh, labor out of this port. Also, we are the first port to support offshore wind project. So we are in the middle of, of uh, the United States being the first again. We've been first many times, right? We were the wealthiest community in the whole entire United States at one time during the, the whaling industry era. Uh, actually, one of the very first banks to be founded um, in Massachusetts, and in particular, southeastern Massachusetts, was in New Bedford. And actually, it's part of the William Museum building, if you had an opportunity to go through there. But I'm sure you, have, you learned that we are very diverse in this area. In America, what is America? What is to be an American, right? I'm sure on your next stop in Illinois, in my understanding, you're going to find a little 
different nuance of what America is, right? Because America is sort of a, a compilation, if you will, of various cultures. Uh, even the food, they say, well, American food, it's American food. Maybe a hamburger, right? Hamburger probably could be American, right? And hot dogs, right? Uh, but the food as well, right? Uh, in this area, is so rich with so many different diverse cultures. Uh, we have a large Portuguese American community. I'm sure you've came across some of I am Portuguese American. Um, we have a, a large Cape Verdean American community, a large Irish American community, uh, Latino community, large, growing fast. Also Franco American community, Polish American community. At one time we had three uh, parishes, Polish parishes in this city. Uh, that's how big also the Polish American community was in, in, in New Bedford. So we have, so we are sort of the gateway to the American dream. People come to the city, they work, they get ahead, th their families get to see the benefits of the opportunities that we have, and then they move on. Sometimes they go to Dartmouth, right? Next door. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I'll t I, I won't give up my neighborhood for any neighborhood, any place else. It's one of the best neighborhoods. I think, and in the city you get a whole different experience. Um, you know, for me, Bristol Community College, of course, and higher education is very important. As, as uh, the president said, my first college experience was at Bristol Community College. Then I moved on to UMass Dartmouth. They think I'm, you know, they think I'm just a UMass Dartmouth grad, right? <laughs> or they, at least they, that's the way they like to project. And and community colleges are very important in the whole higher ed education. Uh, program and area for us in Massachusetts and in other states as well. I mean, uh, today we have, a t today, meaning this year, we accomplished something that we've been working towards is free community college. Okay? And that's because of the support of the legislature. I voted on that budget, right? Uh, and so it was great. Many, many years ago, and I'm sure some of you might not know, but California also used to be free community colleges. Then they changed that. Uh, actually, I, I used to know a couple of folks that used to live in Massachusetts, they were residents of Massachusetts. They went to California, to the community college, because at the time it was free in California, and then they came back home again. But, so here we are, it's a great accomplishment. You know, we are uh, the home, Massachusetts is the home to probably the greatest universities in the world, right? starting with MIT, starting with Harvard and other, other private institutions. But I want to tell you that our public higher ed institutions are equally as good as the private ones. We have Nobel Prize winners from uh, UMass system, uh, from the medical school in particular and other areas. Um, a few years back happened to be a Portuguese American scientist at the, uh, as well originally from this area of the state, his family had immigrated to this area of the state. So we are extremely rich. I'm sure you experience all those things, all those great things, you know. Uh, the other thing that I like about getting to know a little bit about your school, it's, it's a women's, primarily women uh, school. For someone like myself who grew up in a big household, and there were seven sisters, right? I have seven sisters, my mother, who was a very strong woman. He didn't want to cross, cross her too many times. <laughs> and my grandmother, right, on my mother's side, uh, and obviously my grandfather as well used to live with us. But so nine to four, we were outnumbered every single day. And my father used to be very pragmatic, right? Uh, he used to say, just say yes, they run the show. And don't worry about it, everything will be fine, you know? <laughs> so that's how I grew up. Uh, so I have a... Um, women's rights is very important for me, right? Uh, uh, and sometimes people, it's an evolution, right? Uh, 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 over the years, I've been asked to be a member of particular organizations, and on some of them, I did not accept that invitation because at the time, they did not accept women members, right? So some, some of the men sort of got a little offended, so, why wouldn't you want to join? I said, well, pretty simple. I have seven sisters, a mom and a grandma. I'm sorry, I'm not joining that organization if it's only a men organization, right? So um, those have changed too. Those organizations have changed over the years. Uh, and that's all positive, all positive, you know. 
So we have a we we don't have the direct connection. Uh, the Portuguese American community does not have a direct connection to Pakistan, but it has a direct connection to India. You know, the former Prime Minister of Portugal, the one before the, the present one, his name was Antonio Costa. Right, um, one of his parents was from India, uh, from Goa. Goa is a Portuguese area of India, uh, and his brother Ricardo Costa is the head of the head of the Sikh news, which is a, a national uh, TV station in Portugal. His brother's the head of the news program there. Uh, so we are very familiar with culturally diverse areas, not only because we live in New Bedford and we work in New Bedford, but some of our background also, we've experienced those, those cultural um, diversities and it makes, make us all richer really in the end, you know, I usually say New Bedford is rich as it is because of its cultural diversity and its people and what they bring to the table every day uh, to make this place what we think is the best place in the world, right? Uh, or the place that we call home. Uh, yeah, we have, we have a lot of connections, uh, even, f even amongst the Portuguese, for example. Everybody thinks just because you're Portuguese all the same, we are not, right? Because we have, depending on the area of Portugal that you come from, uh, my family and myself come from the Azores, which is the majority of the of the community in this area is from the Azorian, Azorian background, but we have other areas of the, of the nation, of the country, that has slightly different nuances of the culture, and even foods and traditions and, and so forth. Uh, and this area is rich with all of that. Uh, just think about that. Um, and we have a, you know, our Cape Verdean community, for example, awesome, right? They, they've provided so much into the richness of this community, of this city. Not to leave out, we never want to leave out the Irish American community. They also have labored tremendously in this place. And they have fought, by the way, uh, also along the years to make Ireland, and in particular Northern Ireland, a better place for those who are there working every day. So the Irish American community has played a major role in that. Uh, so that's why we are proud of them and what they do in this city as well. So I was told just to talk, right? No specific theme, so I'm going on and on and on because you know, when it, politicians, when they see microphones, it's dangerous, right? <laughs> we can go on and on and on, but you know, I'm so delighted to be here. I was not aware, Professor Javi, uh, congratulations on being a co-founder of this program, it's awesome. Uh, we always hear a lot about exchange programs with, with the Azores or with Portugal or other, other countries, so it's nice to, to know that we have a program of this nature with Pakistan. It's fantastic, that's great. So to all of you, congratulations, and go back. Uh, and when you go back and say, what is America like, right? I'm sure you have a whole different perspective of today what America really is like. Because you're gonna get a different experience in Illinois. If you went to California, you'd get a whole different experience. Uh, or Florida or any other place like that. But we think we, our experience is one that is very common with your experience as well. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, we invite you to stay now for the presentations. And while we're waiting for group one to set up, I do have some gifts to give out to our faculty and um, who are uh, from Pakistan, but also some from here. Um, so um, Zubda, would you like to come up here to hand out the gifts to the, uh, oh, excuse me, Stacy, to give to the faculty? Yes, yes. Um, thank you. If we could call up, um, uh, is it? Yeah. President Douglas, may I please ask you to come up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. May I ask uh, Zubda to come up, please? Uh, 
can we ask, uh, num excuse me, Zoya, and then number after that. And finally, Namra. Okay. Um. Now, could we uh, ask Group One to come up for your presentation, please? Okay, while we're waiting for them to come up, sure. Uh, Dr. Douglas, we have a special gift for you. heavy but I make sure that they deliver to your respective offices so accept them with lots of love from Lahore from Pakistan. choose one and I absolutely love this. This is actually a photograph of a, of a drawing by a student and I'll just read it to you and you can see why I was so um, uh, taken to this. It's called Favorite Activity by Hira, uh, a young woman. I like art and I love drawing. I draw often. That is why I took this photograph. My mother always stops me from drawing. She says I should not do this but I tell her this is my passion. I draw only when I am angry because it is the best time for me to focus only on what I love to do. So it's wonderful to see the determination and resilience that uh, is taken for a student's passion for drama and I think it's just a wonderful sentiment for those of us who are educators and that is always to allow our students to really flourish from within. So thank you. Thank you. So group one, would you like to come up please? So the students were given the charge to, the theme that they had to work on was student empowerment and then we left the rest up to them. The, the idea being that they have to identify an issue that they want something done about and presenting uh, some sort of solution to that. Hi, so we are group one. Our presentation is about childhood trauma, parental abuse and the lasting effects of that. The clicker's not working. <laughs> so first up, it's important to define what is childhood trauma, how that forms, and how that will manifest itself. So first up, this can be formed by cultural norms or standards in parenting. This can be such as a competitive parenting, where a parent may believe their, their child needs to be ahead of other children, putting a lot of pressure on a child. Also, controlling forms of parenting or overbearing forms of parenting. Cultural standards can also reinforce forms of discipline, such as hitting, beating, uh, verbal, or um, yes, yelling. More abusive forms of parenting can also exist, such as sexual assault, abuse, physical violence, and also neglect, which will also manifest themselves. Hello guys, so my name is Shanze, and can you move to the next slide, please? Okay. So, I'll, so can I roll around? Sure. Okay, so I'll be talking about the effects of childhood trauma. Okay, Zach told us about that, what are the types, what are the consequences, and just get into detail. 
But why are we talking to th about childhood trauma at this platform? That is more important to me. Uh, today I wanted to talk about, like he told us that it's sexual abuse, it could be parents scolding the child, but how is it connected to person? So we're gonna see the effect. Like it could, uh, the first, if, like, if I talk about childhood, the first three years, the student doesn't go to school, right? The children stay at home. It's their first schooling experience is from their homes. Their first, you can say, unconditional love is towards their parents, their, uh, their siblings. They learn a lot from there and they incorporate that into their schools. But what if they find parental abuse or scolding of toxic relationship in their household? So that will result in emotional impact for sure. Like you can get anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. And wait, the next slide, please. So one of my favorite effects that I really wanted to talk about was cognitive, cognitive effects. Okay, so let's take an example. We are sitting in a uh, classroom and one, we have two students. One is the one from a very good, healthy relationship of the parents. Another one is from a very toxic household, having a lot of problems. Would you see a difference in their behavior? Yes, for sure. I can tell that, like looking at them by their performance, by the way they talk to me, by the way they socialize. So that really affects our cognitive effects. And actually that is linked to the behavioral. Obviously when we're not focusing in the class, we have something back in our mind. I'm a nutrition, uh, I'm studying nutrition as well. So uh, in nutrition, your body and your mental health relates to each other. If you're eating good, if you're thinking good, that's a positive impact. So similarly, if something's in your mind and you're not focusing, if you're not focusing and giving attention to something, that will have the consequences at the end of the day to your behavior. So there would be aggression, and I've seen a lot of students who get aggressive very easily because they have they have such going so much in their mind due to their household. So can you move to the next? Or actually, I had a story I, I wanted to share. Yeah, so could you go back, Sean? So also for cognitive effects, as she had mentioned, sometimes you can see it in a person. There's other times you can't. I had once worked at a summer camp and I had a student where I tried to teach them every single day how to swim. But she, no matter how hard I tried, I would try to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with her. The student would never learn how to swim. Later on, after the summer camp ended, it was revealed that child was being sexually assaulted by her parent. And because of that, it was impossible for her to overcome those psychological barriers, not just because of the ongoing trauma, but also barriers that trauma created for her. So moving on, okay, so this part is very, very, very close to my heart. That is competition between the two people. Okay, so me and my cousin are the same age, and we went to school together and everything. I was good in English, she was good in math. But at the end of the day, we had so much competition that I had to study math so hard and she had to study English so hard to get equal grades. Because at home, we're like, if she's getting good grades, why can't you get good grades? So that thing that our parents, I think, need to understand that every child has different abilities. So maybe, and that's for sure that you get pressure, pressurized. And I started working on math, 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 and someday, I bet and a lot of students like they're in our university or in more university will get to see that their majors are influenced by their parents and they do not they do not get success in that because they have to, because they wanted to do different but their parents want them to do different so that causes pressure anxiety and, and uh, as I told you the major issue like we don't get to choose the department we want so maybe that can come into the identity issue for sure because we are not getting to do what we really wanted to do. Okay, so this was an um, this was a case study in which there were like seventh four hundred they took four 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 seventh graders from different European and African um, countries where they uh, took their hypothesis was that does parent have any influence on their children and the um, the results were yes they were majorly influencing their children either in a negative or in a positive impact, that means that parents have a lot of impact on their children. So the last one is very important, the long-term effects of childhood sexual abuse. So that's very important. As a childhood, we need to understand the first thing, that if a child 
when like your childhood is related to the close people like you don't get to interact with a lot of people like you don't get to interact with strangers in childhood you're kept in a uh, space where you have your parents your friends your siblings your very close people so if you get abused by your close relatives or someone very close to your heart that will definitely impact on your trusting relationship you know what so for as I told you, relationship issues for sure they uh, there would be they will lack the element of trust. They will lack the element of uh, getting into unhealthy relationship patterns. They will have obviously psychological consequences. There are a lot of suicide cases. We have a lot of um, we have um, substances used to that to overcome the trauma basically. So the next slide. So this was my, one of my favorite things to study. So this was another case study, which was on uh, sexual abuse about the children. It report, okay, so one more thing that we need to know that sexual abuse could be to the woman as well as the men. Like as you can see, it was 25% of the women and 60% of the men as well. So both were subject to the sexual abuse. Okay, so when I was reading this, I came out with the risk factors. I was reading the risk factors. I get it, okay, alcohol, drugs, suicide, then I came to read marrying an alcoholic. So I was I was amused by what why is this factor coming up? Like marrying an alcoholic and sexual abuse, how they are connected. So I looked up, I researched on that. So that basically connects to that low self-esteem. Like when you get sexual abuse, sexually abused, you get so less less uh, low self-esteem that you think that you don't deserve a noble man or a noble woman, you're not that deserving. So marrying an alcoholic would be fine. So, so that's the thing that I really wanted to talk about here, that sexual abuse is just not like uh, walking away from your life. It's like your whole life depends on the trauma. It just develops, you feel like you are, you are no more deserving, as I said. So I think that's really, really, really crucial to talk about here. And now I would like Uniza to tell about the solution. Okay, so we talked about the effects. Now I would like Uniza to talk about the solutions and Start a conversation 
you know, when your child was young, you could you sit with them, you could watch the movie, and then you could be like, okay, these are your emotions. This could, and you could actually learn from it that, okay, if I tell, keep telling my child about all the good stuff in the world, and if I keep, you know, telling them that, okay, if you're feeling sad, if I don't let them process those, those emotions, it's going to end up, they're going to end up with anxiety, and they're going to end up with issues, right? And I like a personal anecdote to share about that. So for a very long time, I became, uh, during my adolescence, I became bored with stuff, right? I was, uh, especially, this was especially during high school, I would be like, why do I even have to do this? Like, why, why do I need to do this? And you see, angry and fear, they relate in their color, right? So it's, uh, so if you like mix these two colors, fear and sadness, you could basically get angry, right? You could get boredom. And then, if you think about it, it was just the sadness that I felt for not being able to do that I wanted to do. Just like Shanze mentioned, because of competition, especially in Pakistan, you there are, your parents do get to influence what you're studying because they're paying for it, right? They're paying for it, so they, they should have some sort of influence, but in some households, it gets strict. So I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to write. I, I was a writer. I had been writing for a long time, but then I couldn't do that for like my major, right? So I just decided, so at one point I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do anything anymore. But that could just have been my fear for, you know, letting down my parents. And that could just have been sadness for not being able to do what I wanted to do. So that's what I'm trying to get at, that when you have suppressed emotions, when you have that kind of adverse experiences in your childhood, that could lead to, you know, problems in your adulthood. And now the recommendation, so this is one recommendation, please, if you haven't checked out the movie, do check it out, watch it with your kids, have your kids show it to their kids, you know. And then, the yeah. Oh yeah, and then we decided we would, so I was wearing green to match, I feel like in Douglas, obviously. And then I thought, why not, you know, discuss this green. And then if you mix colors, you know, if you mix, mix disgust and sadness, you get like the ennui color, that's also like a bit of green. Right? <laughs> and then that's wearing red for anger, and then Chante wearing blue, then we have anxiety right there. <laughs> um, so, uh, moving on to like a bit of a concrete, sort of serious sort of conversation, if you could like, yeah. So, role of higher education institutions, that is what I actually want to talk about. So, in Pakistan, uh, recently, before coming here, we had this uh, seminar by the Anti Narcotics Task Force, the AN ANTF or the ANF. And so it has been in place since 1995 in Pakistan, right? But recently, uh, back in 2015, they formed this affiliation with the higher education institutions. And why, why it was, was that there, there was a prevalence, there, you know, we were getting a prevalence of narcotics and drug abuse in higher education institutions. And they were trying to look into those, you know, trying to look into the reasons for that. And one of the reasons was actually, you know, parental abuse that children who were coming from very strict households when they were getting out, you know, when they were getting a bit of freedom when they were getting to college, they were getting into those that, that kind of stuff. The other reason was also like peer pressure. Because when you come if you come from a strict household, you're coming from a place of low self esteem. And if you're coming from a place of low self esteem, it is you are very easily influenced by other people, right? So then, if someone tells you, okay, you could just try a bit of this, or you could try, try a bit of that substance, you could actually get into that stuff, and it's very possible for help. So higher education, uh, so Canade, it's an art college, it has an anti-narcotics committee. Uh, there, there are faculty members who are part of it, uh, uh, you know, the student council, our head girl is part of that as well. So what I, uh, so what I think I'm suggesting is that, just like the anti-narcotics committee that we have at Canade, or at other colleges, uh, because other colleges are affiliated with the ANF as well, we could have a committee which could actually talk about mental health, which could actually helps, uh, ch help you know, kids when they're coming into college, they're freshmen, they're fresh and new kids, we could help them identify if they have been through something like that, if they have been through abuse, if they have been through you know, problems in their childhood, even something as little as you know, seeing their parents fight, because that is the first step where you can turn them in, you can, you know, you can turn their lives around actually, because your professors in universities, they're people who can turn their lives around. So if you could form, if you know, if universities could work together, if you know, US and Pakistan could work together on that, because the US has lots of uh, resources available, right? You have the suicide helpline, you have other things, you have, uh, you know, uh, mental health facilities available for students. And, it, and while I was researching for this, I found that a 2017 study in Pakistan, it said that for adolescents and for children, there were only five 
trained, uh, you know, uh, by psychiatrists that could help children with trauma. And we're a population of 220 million in Pakistan. So that's where you go, right? So if, uh, you know, because we're a global, we're global citizens now, right? So if we share resources and we're able to come up with, the, with committees, are we able to come up with this one big organization, which other universities and other institutions could attach to, I think that would be very good for students and then students could be part of that. And it could, you know, because it's a ripple effect, right? You start small, you start at one university, we start with Apex, right? And we could go on to do great things. And that is what I think I want to see. Hi, everyone. So I just, as you guys see, I'm just with anxiety and I'm a little bit anxious, so please bear with me. So my role in all of this is to focus more on the resource aspect, the longstanding resources that are in existence right now that people are able to rely upon. And as my colleagues have um, already mentioned, many of the challenges that young people are facing early on in their lives, in their homes, their first experiences, um, with families are, are quite valuable. And if that is a poor example, and they're not, they're not given the necessary tools as small children to be able to move out into the world, what happens when students move, when children move from the younger grades up into college, it's a different lifestyle. There's more freedom that comes with that. So many of the cognitive challenges that they, may be dealing with, and many of the psychological issues that they're dealing with, they are perseverating. And then when they're released out into the community, um, they're embarking out on their next level of education, what happens is a lot of these emotions are starting to, to become discovered. They may not have dealt with them yet, so now they've been triggered, now they have no opportunity but to deal with them. So. Um, it's important to understand that there are already some long, um, long-standing supports that are in place, such as the crisis support services, what I've listed here, the 988 suicide and crisis hotline. Now that's a nationwide resource that anyone can dial into. Um, it's 24-7 support. But then, I'm not sure many people knew this, but Find a Helpline is an actual global tool. So that's available to anyone. If you were to go on the website, you would be able to put in your country and it would allow you to access the resources that are within that country. I also wanted to touch base on a couple of wonderful youth and college mental health services. So um, the National Alliance on Mental Health, or NAMI, they provide services for people that have mental illness as well as substance use disorder. Um, as we learned earlier, there's prevalence of substance use disorder among those that have had challenging childhoods, those that have developed mental illness or those that have mental illness um, diagnosis that are something that they were born with. Um, cultivate behavior health and education and Active Minds are wonderful resources. They also support students that are moving out into the community. Um, so students that are moving into the next le level of education, uh, they have resources and support available to guide them towards resources on their campuses as well as resources within their community support groups. Active Minds is a wonderful organization that encourages the conversation. A lot of time people have not had the opportunity to talk about this. Imagine living in a home and being abused and that is your network. That is all that you know in your life is that, that microchasm of, of just being involved with just family. So when you're out, now you have the ability to be able to talk about that and open up. So Active Minds gives people the ability to come together to collaborate. The next one that I want to really focus on is the peer support and community tools. So Padlet is an application that is, um, it's a collaborative tool. So it allows people to come together just to share their own lived personal experiences. And it is a wonderful opportunity. There are settings on it so that you can monitor, keep everybody's information private. 
but it also allows for the person that is setting it up um, to be able to put resources on there so that if somebody needs support, it's offering guidance. It's not just saying, you know, here, tell us your story. Let's let's talk about it. It's saying you may need to seek professional help if you need if you need it, and as well as being able to add um, more of the basic um, links to videos, links that you can um, guide towards, maybe support groups that focus on, because this can be a wide topic, so there may be just certain instances that a person would want to focus on. So that's just a really wonderful way to share those tools. So with that, I'm gonna go to my, the next person, and thank you so much for listening. So this is Samahe, and I will be concluding the points that my friends have just discussed. The impact of the childhood trauma on the long-term mental health underscores the need for a global address. Higher education institutions in both the Pakistan and USA can play a transformative role by fostering the mental health awareness and the use of the global resources like the National Alliance of the Medical Illness and which is one of the uh, nation's largest grassroots mental health organization and uh, innovative tools like Padlet can address this trauma more effectively. So Padlet is a, di a digital corkboard that can be used for the mental health and uh, it can be used by sharing the resources and practices. Uh, collaboration between Pakistan and USA can further enhance these efforts by sharing the practices and resources uh, that are raised to the mental health awareness as addressing childhood trauma is a shared responsibility. Such partnerships are essential for shaping uh, public policy and Pakistan and USA can help build a future uh, where mental health is treated as an integral uh, societal well-being, empowering, empowering individuals to succeed uh, both professionally and in their personal lives. Thank you. So thank you so much everyone. Thank you, Group One, for that very uh, lighthearted presentation. Uh, ours don't have any Disney movies, though, unfortunately. <laughs> no. My name is Alexandra Kuzno, and I am from the United States. And I am happily introducing our project on possible solutions to racial and religious discrimination. As humans, our brains naturally tend to categorize things in an attempt to understand the world better. Discrimination, at its most basic direct sense, is something that it strikes at the very core of humanity. While it is a slippery concept, a main element of the paradigmatic cases of discrimination is the disadvantages of differential treatment. It is, the harming someone's, it is harming someone's right simply because of who they are and who, what they believe. Often discrimination stems from fear and misunderstanding. Religious discrimination is defined by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission as treating a person, an applicant or employee, unfavorably because of their religious beliefs or practices. Religious discrimination is defined as when an individual is mistreated or shamed simply because of the color of their skin, what they look like, and or certain characteristics that they have, that they may have been, they may, can be stereotyped because of their race. Worldwide racial prejudice is more likely to affect Africans, black people, and non-white locals. Among the, sorry, among the religions that experience the most religious prejudice are Muslims and Jews. U.S. studies, sorry, sorry, according to various studies and surveys conducted by Pew Research Center, Asian, Hispanic, and black individuals are also most likely to face discrimination against them in the U.S. When it comes to religious discrimination, 82% of American citizens believe that Muslims today face at least some pre prejudice, according to Pew Research Center. Moreover, about two-thirds of Americans, that's 62%, believe that Jews in the United States experience some form of discrimination. There have been some studies, there have been many studies on the effective diversity and inclusion practices that we will investigate in our presentation today. Racial and religious discrimination in the US and Pakistan is still alive and well and causes many effects including on people's physical and mental health. But there are possible solutions to prevent discrimination that we'll be talking about today. Hello, my name is Edward. I'm from the United States. I will be discussing a few case studies today. Our first case study is racial discrimination in the work environment in the US. 
Uh, oftentimes, when examining racial inequality, studies look to wage gaps between different racial groups. Black employees earn around 30 to 35 percent less than white employees. Uh, Hispanic employees earn around 20 to 25 percent less than white employees. And Asian employees can earn around 8 percent less or equal wages to white employees. However, in a study by Leshen Zhang for the American Sociological Review, focuses instead on, on the racial disparities within the work environment, such as company culture, promotion opportunity, managerial quality, and the physical work environment. Zhang finds that there is a large disparity in firm culture and managerial quality for black employees compared to all racial groups. Zhang claims this is likely due to exclusionary practices and racial discrimination, especially in more conservative areas. These findings are quite striking and goes to show the continued discrimination of black individuals in America and the continued fight for racial equality. Um, yes. So the next case study is religious discrimination in the US. Uh, the United States is predominantly Christian country with other predominant religions uh, being non-religious slash other, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists. There is evidence of increasing religious tension, especially as the country becomes more secular. And in 2016, Christian identity also began to tie in with racial white identity in an already polarized country about race. 2016 also saw a rise in religious hostility with an increase in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. The group that faces the most discrimination in the US are Muslims, followed by Jews. 62% of Muslim respondents said they face hostility due to their religious affiliations while well, 36% of Jewish people reported the same compared to 22% of Christian people, which is similar to the 20% of Buddhist people, and only 9.7% of Hindus reported that they faced hostility, and 32% of non-religious people said they faced hostility. There are potential other factors that go into religious discrimination that these groups face, such as race, gender, or language spoken, but collecting that, difficult, that data is difficult. Uh, more research needs to be done on the intersectionality of these issues, because they're very important, and the potential hostilities faced by other minority religions that were not able to be discussed. But it is evident that the fight for religious equality in the US is ongoing, as well as our racial fight. Our next case study is going to be about racial discrimination in the US and the cause and effects on mental and physical health. Uh, frequent instances of racial discrimination in the United States involve the extreme threat of poor mental and physical health of minorities. It is historically evident that the mental health of racial minorities has suffered for decades, and these effects are still prominent today. The analysis of the data concluded that black men had faced, who had faced more racial discrimination were more likely to develop symptoms of depression and suicide during their lifetime, and had suggested that non-overt or initially minor racial aggressions induce a development of increasing stress over time that would lead to poor mental health symptoms. In addition to the mental health of black adolescents, a study through JMAA Pediatrics regarding the analysis of age-related racial disparities through suicide rates had stated that in the last decade, quote, black children aged five to 12 were two times more likely to die by suicide relative to white children, end quote. Data had also shown a strong correlation of Latinos facing racial discrimination and cardiovascular disease, and significant poor general health rating for those who faced racial discrimination and its correlation to unemployed minorities. The creation of stress-inducing environments for minorities through even, through even minor microaggressions can cause extreme long-term mental and physical harm, and continue to put the lives of minority races in danger, in danger the more systematic racism prevails, sorry. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Haley Sakwick, and I'm from the United States. And I will be continuing about talking from case studies about Pakistan and the United States. So the first one I will be talking about is racial discrimination in Pakistan in the Harashi, Haza, Hazara Shia community. One example of the racial discrimination in Pakistan is discussed below through a case study done by multiple authors about on the migrant Hazara Shias of Pakistan and their social determinants for PTSD, mental disorders, and life satisfaction. The Hazara Shia community in Quetta, Pakistan, a marginalized population that has long experienced targeted violence, discrimination, and extreme hardship, is the subject of this study's focus on life satisfaction and mental health issues. 
Known perpetrators against the Hazara Shias have not been punished either due to their strong religious or political affiliation or the poor judicial, judicial system. The goal of the study was to pinpoint the major variables affecting their well-being, especially the frequency of PTSD and the influence of social demographic variables like gender work and social support. Furthermore, individuals more, were more likely to suffer from mental health illness if they had less support from the community, particularly from national, ethnic, and religious organizations. The study used structural equation modeling to determine that, to determine that four important factors influence life happiness financial security, work satisfaction, community satisfaction, and home stability. Qualitative, qualitative research has also identified obstacles such as job difficulties, financial instability, and the worries of discrimination and abuse, with a majority of participants, participants reporting low life satisfaction and being either illiterate or semi-literate. The study empathized the extreme poverty in the neighborhood. Hazara Shias, who reside in Cuera's ghetto because of security concerns, deal with a number of exab exaggerated problems included limited mobility, support housing, and little prospects. The next case study is forced conversions in Pakistan. According to a case study done by Haroon Jonjua for Jerizia in 2022, Pooja Kumari, an 18-year-old Hindu girl, was murdered in March 2021 in Rohir Sindhu Sindh province after resistance and abduction intended for forced marriage and conversion to Islam. Despite her family's attempt to seek police protection from her harasser, Wahid Box Lasari, a member of a powerful local tribe, they received no assistance. Legal experts emphasized the urgent need for effective legal legislation to safeguard minority rights, as highlighted by Kamari's case and similar incidents. In addition to Pooja Kamari's tragic story, numerous other instances of violence and discrimination revealed the persuasive nature of religious intolerance in Pakistan. According to the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, there were over 1,000 reported inc incidents of violence against religious minorities from 2013 to 2021, with Christians, Hindus, and Ahmadis being particularly targeted. For instance, the 2013 suicide bombing at All Saints Church in Peshawar killed 86 Christians and illustrated the deadly consequences of sectarian violence. Moreover, a 2019 report from the Minority Rights Group Inter International highlighted that over 50% of the Christian population lives in poverty facing systemic barriers to education and employment opportunities, which further marginalizes these communities. These statistics underscore the urgent need for policies and initiatives aimed at protecting the rights of religious minorities and fostering a more inclusive society in Pakistan. And the last case study is about religious discrimination in Pakistan, blasphemy laws. Pakistan's blasphemy laws, which have roots in colonial area legislation and, further, and were further strengthened during the Islamization policies of the 1980s, imposed several penalties, including the death penalty for offenses against the Prophet Muhammad. These laws disproportionately impact re religious minorities, particularly Christians, Shia Muslims, and Ahmadis, and are often misused to settle personal disputes. Religious minorities are particularly particularly vulnerable and many face violent retaliation before any formal changes are presented. Alarmingly, those who are falsely accused who are falsely accuse others of blasphemy or engage in vigilant violence often go unpunished. Since 1987, advocacy groups report that over 2,100 people have been accused of blasphemy in Pakistan, with 40 currently on death row and at least 89 killed by mobs <coughs> based on accusations alone. Despite the rise in violence, little is being done to address these issues effectively. As of 2023, there are at least 53 people in custody across, across Pakistan on blasphemy charges, according to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. A high-profile example of the, use of, of the misuse of blasphemy law is the case of Asia Bibi, a Christian woman sentenced to death in 2010 after being accused of, insult, of insulting the Prophet Muhammad during a dispute with her neighbors. The incident, which began over a disagreement about a bucket of water, escalated when Bibi, a Christian, was accused of making water unclean after drinking from it. The woman involved in the dispute allegedly, allegedly push, pressured her to convert, convert to Islam, and Bibi's response was later interpreted as blasphemous. She spent years on death row after being, before being acquitted, before, but her case deeply polarized the nation. Thank you. Assalamualaikum everyone, I'm Hanya Adnan. And I'm going to talk about uh, the impact of racial discrimination 
on the mental health of people. So when you go to the US, we, uh, we see that the discrimination is mostly directed towards black people, indigenous people, and the people of color. And it takes the form of uh, chronic stress, microaggression, and unequal access to resources. So eventually these situations develop into medical, uh, mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And they linger with them throughout their life because they're continuously exposed to discrimination and it is a continuous process which you know, destroys the lifestyle of people. So they are uh, in the community, their fear and mistrust is um, developed and in the marginalized communities. So, and eventually they develop, uh, they uh, adopt unhealthy coping mechanisms like substance abuse. And it does not only impact their mental health, but also their physical health as well. And similarly in Pakistan, uh, uh, discrimination takes the form of social exclusion. And it develops self-doubt, inferiority complex, and stuff like this. And the bigger problem over there is that there is a social stigma attached to mental health, uh, uh, seeking mental health assistance. So it further worsens these issues. So there needs to be work done on uh, promoting and accepting mental health conditions and uh, eliminating these discriminatory uh, acts as well. And so uh, for that, we have possible solutions to prevent discrimination. And one of the most impactful one I find is uh, exchange programs because I personally connect to this. Before coming to America, I had my concerns. Oh my God, I, I am wearing a hijab. or oh, I'm wearing a hijab. Uh, maybe people will hate me over here. So, but when I came here, the reaction of people were totally different. They were so welcoming. They were so understanding about this. So, you know, I had my preconceptions about America, and I had my preconceived ideas about how American people will react to uh, seeing me. But, you know, we break stereotypes when we meet, when we have one-on-one -on -one interactions with people from different cultures. So, this is a really uh, impactful thing that I find that it can help rewind discrimination and it can fight uh, discrimination. And so there are, there are so many studies that say that there are uh, undergrad students who are studying here, they are more uh, appreciative of the cultural diversity and they are more empathetic towards each other. So it is a forum that can uh, bridge cultural gaps. It can form that we can get to know more about each other's cultures and we can accept each other's culture more about it. Like for example, if I'm sitting uh, in my free time uh, I would not look up uh, on Google like, what, which language is spoken in Ghana or which, uh, the, what are the customs of Egypt. But when I am in a diverse, in a diverse situation in where there are so many people, then I would like to ask them about their culture, their languages, their customs, their cuisines, there is so much more. So I find uh, that this is one of the most impactful things that we can do to prevent discrimination. Uh, thank you, this is from my side, and I would like to call Menahil for the rest of the <laughs> Okay. Hello everyone, this is Minahil. I'll be covering um, a few of the possible solutions that we need to prevent uh, discrimination. Um, also, I'll be, uh, I have my notes here because this topic is so close to my heart and I don't want to miss anything. I really want us to work on this together. So the, one of the possible solutions is it reflected in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Let's start by exploring this in workplaces in America and Pakistan. Did you guys know that 70% of the job seekers prioritize diverse work environments that champion diversity? And you know, the reason is simple. And by the way, so do I. Because the reason is simple because inclusive environment not only promotes equality, it helps reduce discrimination and build stronger teams. The performance and workplace is just, it gets so much better and so much more efficient when everybody from diverse backgrounds, when everybody feels included, they feel like their voices are being heard. And I feel like, I feel that here as well. And back in Canada, when, where we have a diverse group of people, and it's, I'm honestly going to use this platform to thank everyone who chose me chose me to come to America because this, uh, the warmth that I felt and the diversity over here, it's just really heartwarming and it, because nobody, everybody feels like home and so that's the importance of diversity, equity and inclusion both in workplace and education. So 
you know, my fellow colleague talked about Apex both on a personal and a societal level. The, the, the key is the magic, the real magic happens when open communication exists. Open communications helps all of us feel comfortable sharing our stories. And to, you know, it encourages sharing and it creates such a healthier environment. Everybody feels comfortable knowing, okay, I belong here as much as this other person. So listening and supporting each other is very important. You have to make sure that while you want to feel heard, so does the other person. So make sure that you apply this in your lives as well. And programs like Apex, they're game changers. And I've experienced that myself as well, because nearly 70% of the graduates, according to statistics uh, from such programs, go on to take leadership positions to promote interfaith dialogues and combat stereotypes. And I plan to do so as well using my professional field as well. Next slide, please. Celebra celebrating cultural diversity. This is so much important because you know, it resides in the fact that it fosters understanding, acceptance, and inclusivity. We have already talked about that a little bit. Um, and it helps break down barriers and promote mutual respect, which is so important for, for, you, for us to work together for the greater good of our society, of our future generations. Because so many children these days, they're f facing anxiety issues and other mental health issues that we need to make them feel comfortable enough to express themselves and be present as much as they deserve to. Can we go into the next picture? I actually want to share something. So we have, luckily we got a chance to visit the Brown University and I also want to thank Edward who's my Jewish friend over here. He ta taught me about the sukkah and the festival of Sukkot. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And, um, and so it warmed my heart to see the Jewish students back in uh, Brown University, they built the sukkah, which is a temporary tent, um, uh, which is uh, built to uh, uh, celebrate the festival of sukkah. But the students at Brown, they did so in solidarity with Gaza. I don't want to get political, but it's worth, uh, we need to give a, ha a hand of applause because they're so brave. They, they, are at the, they are facing criminal charges for something that, to make sure that uh, their fellow stu uh, Muslim stu uh, Muslims and other human beings that they have no connection to in another country, in another continent, feel as safe as they do as well. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, next slide, please. Media. Media plays such an important role. There was a time when it, when it would take, t because Y uh, years and years for cul uh, for cultural diffusion to play its game, but now use because we're facing high techno high uh, speed technological development. And before coming here, even I used the social media and the internet to learn about America. I was quite nervous, but then again, when uh, media played such an important role for me to feel safe because I learned everybody is so heartwarming here and I experienced that myself as well and I thank you all for giving us such a warm welcome so this is really important to that we use utilize social media and other media platforms including print media to let people share their stories so we learn from them and so we can make a difference so we do not have uh, make the same mistakes that our elders did or we unintentionally did in maybe marginalizing or making some someone feel uncomfortable because of uh, any reason. And um, yeah, so this, these solutions go beyond policies and academic curriculum. We can utilize these in our daily conversation. I see a diverse group of intellectual people in front of me, and um, you guys need to understand the power and responsibility you hold, because with great power comes great responsibility to make a change this big for our fellow human beings and for the wellness of our future generation. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, Assalamu alaikum basically means peace be upon you. 
And let me just start off with my presentation. I will be discussing a few re reforms that we can make in order to make ourselves more better and to combat uh, racial, or ra race, racial or religious discrimination that might exist. So the National Commission for uh, Justice and Peace uh, reports that Pakistan needs to have more reporting system in place. So we do have a, a few, a lot of minorities in Pakistan, and sometimes they might face some uh, discrimination, and we need to have uh, you know a proper reporting system in order to combat that. Other than that, reforms uh, should be added to the existing laws in Pakistan. These laws can be made in accordance, they can be made uh, in accordance to the actual laws that they were intended to be instead of it being something political or other than that. Um, it can be something we can make more laws that uh, allows more marginalized or some uh, any minority community to have more jobs in the public and private sector. So everyone feels like like they are heard and they are seen in the community as well. And this is something that we can do with America as well. Even though America, as we have seen and I have uh, personally witnessed that America is a very diverse country. And uh, having even more positions uh, of power for mi minorities and other uh, other ethnicities uh, will make them have a, a new voice in the country as well, even though they do so a lot here. And I think Pakistan and all the other countries can learn a lot from America. Other than that, um, we need to, we can maybe create a nationwide database to monitor crimes where someone is uh, discriminated against. We can also add, uh, you know, more opportunities in the private or corporate sector as well. And uh, as we mentioned that, you know, in different solutions that we mentioned, education plays a very important part. So education um, needs to be given to everyone other than uh, even in education, we need to have uh, you know various holidays, and we need to celebrate more cultures and study them in more depth, so that we can learn about each other. So when because when you learn about each other, you found out that you have more similarities and differences. Even when I came here, I found out that we really do have a lot of similarities with America as well, because we're also from you know a big city in Pakistan, and um, there a lot of things are you know influenced. Their infrastructure and some of their places are influenced by uh, the global northern cities. So it's it's really amazing to see that here as well. Uh, next, yeah, this one. So we're talking, we, we talked about education before as well. We can talk about it in detail. So the purpose of education, according to a 19, uh, 1996 uh, report, says that education uh, serves four purposes. That is learning to be. That is you need to act, uh, you need to in become an individual who acts respons with responsibility. Uh, learning to do. That is, you become a person who tries to specialize in skills and teamwork, learning uh, learning to become a better person, and learning to live together, which is something that we can work on even more, so that we can gain more understanding and appreciation for the others. So education plays a very critical role in creating an individual with the ability to think and to work with others and to you know uh, dispel discrimination. And so we can work with education in order to combat discrimination as well, such as training faculty and uh, making them aware of uh, new cultures, because then uh, teachers, they uh, also shed that knowledge with the students as well. We can break any segregation that might be there, and teachers can discuss some hard topics. Even in this presentation today, we touched upon some very difficult topics that, we, that were actually very difficult for us to present as well. Um, our American fellows, they had to discuss some very serious issues that might be pla taking place in America and you know that might be taking place in Pakistan but I feel like it, it's very important to have these difficult conversations and um, and and I mean America is an amazing country and when we see you know when we see someone who is in such a leadership position and we see something that might not be going right it, it affects us a lot more so uh, because we are I feel like we are in a position where we can learn a lot from America so uh, I think we, it's, it, there's a need to discuss more of these hard topics. And coming to the conclusion of my topic, next slide, please. 
So in conclusion, um, I think the fight against discrimination is very cruel, uh, very crucial in a society that may be divided. And there, are, there is no denying the impacts that, uh, the, the negative in the impacts that are on the marginalized group. And they, you know, they cause serious emotional, mental, and physical suffering. However, I do feel that there is still room for optimism. And I, I am really optimistic for the human, uh, hu human ability to overcome this. And um, we, we, we have the means to create a world where we can live and we can be uh, just human beings. We, we don't need to be Pakistanis, we don't need to be Americans, we can live in a world where we are just human beings. Other than that, um, I would like to just touch upon the few topics that we discussed as the solutions. We discussed art, we discussed education, we discussed different reforms. So these are some of the things that we can do to embrace different cultures and varieties and you know promote more one-on-one -on -one, uh, interactions that dismantle barriers. And um, lastly, I would say that uh, only by doing this will, will we be able to build a society where equality, love, and respect are the norms by which we all live. And humanity tri triumphs over whatever hate that might exist. So I change, uh, some change is do really is long overdue, and it begins with every one of us. And I hope that uh, when we walk out of the room, we, we you know, continue to break stereotypes all around us. Thank you.